adventure not I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut today we'll go bird watching tomorrow we'll catch toads the next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things And I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case Open and shut No doubt about it I'm a nature nut Hey, guess where we are? <coughs> We're in Blue Springs, or I'm in Blue Springs. It's not really blue, but that doesn't matter right now. In Florida, Central Florida, Blue Springs State Park. This is one of my favorite places. Now, mind you, I haven't spent a lot of time here. I was only here for a few hours about 17 years ago, but I really am happy to be back. And I think today, what I'd like to do is for us to explore the springs of Central Florida, including Blue Springs, and see what we can find. Now, I guess I should start out by explaining how springs work but you know it's pretty simple water comes out of the ground that's geology I'm not a geology guy I'm a biology guy I'm more interested in the critters speaking of which let's start with this one you know what that is pileated woodpecker whapping on a tree in every stand of forest old from Miami to BC well the last time we saw him we were near BC now we're near Miami that's a good sign Excellent, good start. Let's go see what else is hanging around these springs. Let's go have a look. I feel a certain spring in my step. Okay, wait a minute. I thought I could get away without explaining springs. The rest of the crew said, nope, you gotta do it, John. So here's how it works. It rains far from here. The rain falls on the ground. It soaks into the ground until it comes to a porous layer of rock called the Florida Aquifer. And it flows through that porous layer of rock underneath another layer of rock that won't let the water out. Kind of like a natural, really hard waterbed. And then there's a leak. There's a leak that leads to the surface and the water burbles up through that leak. And that's what forms the spring. In this case, one could call it an artesian spring, almost forgot the word. At Blue Spring, that leak is a limestone cave that's about 120 feet deep. The water comes rushing up through there and runs down the uh, Blue Spring Run and into the river. At other springs, it burbles to the surface, much closer to the surface. Like right behind me here, you can see the sand being scoobled around by the, uh, flubulated around, I don't know what the word is, this geology, by the water, and then it runs down this little creek. But basically, that's how it works. Rain falls here, goes underground, comes up, ha, a spring, an artesian spring, spring under pressure. Now, let's go look for some critters. Hot springs are produced when groundwater is warmed by the heat of the Earth's core, but most springs are not hot springs. Hmm. Well, here's something cool. This is a nephila. A nephila is a huge orb-weaving spider. This guy, I mean, they're really, really, really unmistakable with those sort of yellow and black fuzzy tufted legs and the long body very very interesting this one doesn't have much of a web going but you know there are related spiders in asia that are used to make minnow nets people bend little uh, you know flexible twigs over and tie them at the bottom and then leave them out in good nephila habitat the spiders build a web and you can use it to scoop up minnows never tried that if you have let me know how it works yagahuga that is one Ugly yet beautiful spider. Well, I'll tell you, there's one thing you always see a lot of here, and that's raccoons. You gotta like raccoons. Of course, raccoons live all sorts of other places, not just around the Florida Springs, but you always see them at the Florida Springs. They seem very much at home here, almost too at home, if you know what I mean. No matter how many signs they put up telling you not to feed them, people still feed them. The rangers just told us these ones are probably rabid. 
That could be ranger talk, or it could be danger talk. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Raccoons can often be seen in daylight, but they are most active after dark. Well, now let's, uh, let's talk about the most famous denizen of the Florida Springs, the manatee. Now, I've just been in all morning snorkeling with the manatees. Manatees are the greatest, let's face facts. It's hard to, uh, hard to think of anything more spectacular that could live in these places than the manatee. But let me back up a bit here. Manatees, we're talking here about the Florida manatee, which is a subspecies of the West Indian manatee, which is an endangered animal. There are only about 2,000 of these critters alive on Earth today. And, you know, think about that. That's like the entire human population of the world reduced to the, a town the size of Burstall, Saskatchewan. Frightening thought. Not very many manatees, no matter how you, how you slice it. But I think they're going to do very well. In most places, they are very tightly protected. Uh, here at the Crystal River, you can actually get out with a snorkel, manatee snorkeling tour uh, operator. There are six of them here. And, um, and get in the water and snorkel with the manatees. Most other places, they try to keep people and manatees uh, away from one another. But the manatees are so interesting because they're curious. They come right up to you. They let you sort of rub them on the belly. They're very, very peaceful, not at all aggressive. Manatees are part of the group of mammals called sirenians. That word siren actually has something to do with mermaids and Greek sirens in mythology and so on, but that's another story, and I'm sure you've heard that one too. Manatee relatives are probably the origin of the mermaid legend. They have a big paddle-shaped tail, not a forked tail. The tail moves up and down, and they are very peaceful, squinty-eyed little plant eaters, or big plant eaters, I should say. A big one here can weigh a ton. They're different from whales, dolphins, and porpoises. They're also different from seals and sea lions and walruses. They are their own little weird group of aquatic mammals, sort of semi-related to elephants. You can still see the big toenails on their front flippers. And I think the manatees are going to do well because the people here really like manatees and the manatees like people. And I think that the days when manatees were being killed frequently by boat propellers are probably over. You still see manatees with scars on their backs, but uh, in a place like this, the boat speed limits are very carefully regulated and people are, uh, you know, keen on their manatees. I'm keen on their manatees. So I'm hoping that the world will be safe for manatees and for womanatees and for humanities in the future. That's my dream. I'm sticking to it. The Stellar's sea cow, a manatee relative, is now extinct due to overhunting. Now when you visit the Florida Springs, spend some time looking at the bottom through the water, watching for something about the size of a hamburger, walking around on the bottom. You know, when you think about it, the manatee, I mean, yeah, they come into the springs in the winter to warm up, but they're not really the signature species of the springs. If you want my vote, the signature species is the loggerhead musk turtle. Most of the time, they're just walking around on the bottom of the spring looking for something to eat. They're nifty little critters. They're quite closely related to the common musk turtle, which you may know by its popular names, the stink pot or the stinking gym. They have little stink glands at the base of the tail to discourage other animals from uh, eating them. That's why they're called musk turtles. These turtles spend a lot of time underwater, just walking on the bottom. It doesn't seem that they have to breathe very often, so they don't come up to the surface very much. The reason for that, at least part of the reason, is that they can breathe 
through their skin. They can't breathe very well through their skin, but they can get enough oxygen just through their skin from the water that they can stay under for immense amounts of time. When they do come up to bask, to dry off, they'll get into a tangle of vegetation and they're hard to see. So really the best way to see them is to either look through the water or to get in with a snorkel and a mask and look for them that way. I really like them. Seems to me that there should be loggerhead musk turtle snorkeling tours alongside the manatee snorkeling tours. Should be able to go into the gift shops around here and get loggerhead musk turtle postcards and little stuffed toys and things like that. I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. I'm still waiting for the rest of the world to catch up with my enlightened attitudes. I know you're with me, but the rest of the world, whew, they're taking their time. How can they not notice the loggerhead musk turtle? It's a beautiful thing. A spring thing. Okay, well let's have another look at these manatees. We're back at Blue Springs, and I want you to realize just how different these creatures are from whales and porpoises on the one hand and seals and sea lions on the other hand. Let's start at the back of their bodies. They are they're very much like a whale in the sense that they don't have any vestiges left of the hind limbs. It's just, you know, a fishy looking body and the round tail moves up and down, not side to side, very much like a whale. The middle of the body is very big, fat and cow-like because after all, they live like cows, like underwater cows just browsing away, taking her easy. Up near the front, the front limbs have become flippers but they're not a fixed, firm flipper like a whale flipper or a dolphin flipper. They have joints in them, and you can see them curving their flippers around as they swim. That's because they still have the same bones in their front limbs that we have in ours, and all the uh, joints are still there, except for the finger joints, of course, which uh, they don't need because it's just a flipper. The face is much like the face of a walrus without the tusks. And when you think about um, whales and so on, whales are quite different from seals and sea lions and walruses. They have their nostrils up on the top of the head. They've migrated back uh, so that they can breathe without having to stick their nose up. But manatees, they, uh, they have much more of a normal mammal face. They simply have valves, little flaps that go over the nostrils and keep them closed until they come to the surface. Then they open the, the flaps, take a breath, and down they go. Works very well for them. They're beautifully adapted to these sorts of shallow freshwater and uh, saltwater habitats. I really like them. Manatees, a species of sirenian. There is a second species of manatee, and it lives a mysterious life in the forests of West Africa. So have you ever noticed that paintings, artists' conceptions of what it was like in Western North America during the late Cretaceous period, the end of the age of dinosaurs, they look a lot like this part of Central Florida. Now there's a reason for that. It's because in those days the climate was much warmer and the Gulf of Mexico, which is fairly close to here somewhere, it used to extend right up the middle of the continent up into Alberta and Saskatchewan and the conditions along the coast of the Gulf, they were much like the conditions here today. In fact, many of the creatures that lived alongside the dinosaurs, they still live here and they have changed very little since the age of dinosaurs themselves. Think about things like alligators and crocodiles. Think about turtles, especially soft-shelled turtles. Uh, a garfish or a very primitive kind of fish and even some of the plants, like the cycads. Now the native Florida cycad is actually a small one. Most of the tropical species are bigger. They look like the top of a palm tree with no trunk. Cycads were once very abundant back in the Jurassic period when dinosaurs like Stegosaurus probably ate a lot of cycads, but eventually they were replaced largely by flowering plants, giving us the sort of flora we see today. In that sense, it's a very primitive looking place here, and you might think that a dinosaur could be lurking, waiting to pop its head out of the undergrowth at any time. That's probably why they made one of my favorite films here. 
Do you remember the creature from the Black Lagoon? Ooh, that was a dandy one. Shot in black and white in 3D. It starred Richard Carlson and it was set in the Amazon basin, but they shot it in a spring rather close to here because the Amazon basin, it doesn't really look like uh, it does around here and the water is not as clear. You need nice clear water for an underwater monster movie. And ooh, it had some great moments. You remember that uh, that part near the beginning where they find the fossilized arm sticking out of the side of the hill? It's really dramatic in 3D. What is it, Professor? I don't know. Never seen anything like it before. Oh, wonderful. If you haven't seen it, rent it tonight. Creature from the Black Lagoon. Some swamp put up a rundown shack. I was warned by the drugstore geezer. Don't go out at night and beware the creature. June in the black lagoon, warm and dark in the soggy swamp. One day my corgi disappeared. He's been gone for about three years. Went out to play in the driving rain One last bark Never saw him again Typhoon in the black lagoon I lost my dog in the flood of fall Well then my chickens, one by one Were plucked from the hen I was too oblivion The drugstore geezer just shook his head a critter from the swamp. That's all he says. I saw it in the water, the eerie wake. Was not a gator or a cottonmouth snake. I thought it was the creature. I let out a whale, but it had a black eye mask and little rings around its tail. It was the coon. Black Lagoon, a ringtail thing from the Florida Springs. That coon was not the culprit, cause Fluffy he came back. There were feathers in his teeth and his fur was muddy black. I knew there was no creature, I knew we'd be alright. Cause now I knew what made those noises in the swamp at night. It was the coon from the Black Lagoon. It's just the perfect place for freshwater fish watching. I mean, can you imagine any place better? There's lots of places I've been with nice clear water, but very few of them have as many different kinds of fish. You don't even have to go in the water. You can just look off the manatee viewing platforms, and when everybody else is looking at the manatees, you can look at the fish. Wonderful things like great big tarpon. Tarpon's a very popular sport fish beautiful big-headed long-whiskered catfish and uh, things like gar and tilapia and mullets and so on it's just wonderful it's a beautiful beautiful place to watch fish but really when you get right down to it if you're gonna watch fish at uh, one of these springs you might as well try to get in the water take your snorkeling stuff that's what I'm gonna do right now and let's see what we can find I'll warn you the water is always less clear looking once you're underneath than it is from the top, but hey, I'm not picky. <laughs> A little trouble with the purge valve there. 
Well, there goes a few introduced cichlids, tilapia, but most of the fish that we saw in the springs were sunfish of one sort or another. Most of these are bluegill sunfish, and we did see a few red-bellied sunfish as well. They're very, very interesting fish with very complicated nesting behavior, quite territorial, and although they don't show a lot of this behavior in the winter, in the spring, they develop very bright colors, and they, uh, ooh, they're fascinating. Fantastic fishes. Here's a nice little group. The young ones are the ones with the dark bars on the sides. The adults are the, uh, the more plain colored ones, although this one shows a few little bits of color. Ooh, and there's the biggest member of the sunfish family, the largemouth bass. And the terror of them all, the primitive, predaceous garfish. Not bad, eh? Oh, I love it down there. So neat. Now, it's nothing like coral reef snorkeling, mind you, because you're not going, ooh, nice colors all the time. To do this kind of stuff, you actually have to like fish. By gar. Oh, excuse me, I'm going back. Gar are primitive fish with a fleshy lobe in their tail and hard bony scales instead of thin flexible ones. Well, that's about all the time we have to talk about springs. I've really enjoyed myself here and it's kind of weird, don't you think, that we could make a show about springs in the winter. Springs, one of those words, can mean just about anything. It can mean a season, round metal thing that's kind of curly, place where water comes out of the ground, spring rolls, spring chicken. It's like the word run or the word cast. I think about these things from time to time, but most of the time I'm just a nature nut. And I hope you are too. And we'll see you again soon. Hey, you know this fountain of youth is supposed to be around here somewhere, bubbling out of one of these springs? I think I found it. I'm feeling very youthful. Hope springs eternal. Boing, boing, boing. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. <laughs>